From Wondery, this is American History Tellers. Our history, your story. I'm Lindsey Graham. Next week, we'll be back with the first episode in a brand new six-part series on prohibition. Please stick around to listen to a preview at the end of this episode. But today, we'll be talking with two very special guests about the Cold War, the author of our series, Audra Wolf, and the historian and host of Tides of History, Patrick Wyman. Before we talk with them, I want to thank you so much for listening to our show. In the month since we've launched American History Tellers, the response from you, our listeners, has been overwhelming. We've already surpassed a million listeners, and a lot of you have left great reviews on Apple Podcasts or left us kind messages on our social media pages. We wouldn't be able to do any of this without you. So if you haven't left us a review yet, please do. We love to know what you think about this show. We also want to especially thank our sponsors for supporting us during this first series. So thank you to ZipRecruiter, Squarespace, HelloFresh, Stamps.com, Zola, Quip, and eHarmony. And thank you to all the listeners who used those promo codes we gave out. By visiting our sponsors' websites, you are directly supporting this podcast. And finally, do you have a topic you would love us to cover? You can tell us what you'd like to hear in a survey at wondery.com survey. If you've already taken it, thank you. Keep an eye on the American History Teller's feed. Your pick could be coming up soon. If you like this podcast, you're probably looking for other great history podcasts to listen to. Wondery, the network behind this show, has other podcasts for you, especially if you love the way we tell stories here on American History Tellers. Great shows like Tides of History and Fall of Rome are fantastic trips back in time that give you a, a visceral feel for what life in those times might have been. And if more modern history is your thing, I'm going to go ahead and recommend my first podcast with Wondery, the political thriller Terms. It's a scripted audio drama, but is it fictional? Just head to apple.co slash Wondery. That's apple.co slash Wondery. Or if you're on an Android, just head to Wondery.fm. Up first today, you'll hear from the woman who wrote this series, Audra Wolf. She's a writer editor, and historian with an expertise in the science of the Cold War. Her most recent book is Competing with the Soviets, Science, Technology, and the State in Cold War America. Coming in the fall of 2018, her newest book, Freedom's Laboratory, The Cold War Struggle for the Soul of Science, focuses on the role of science as a form of cultural diplomacy during the Cold War. Audra joined me via Skype from her home in Philadelphia. Here's our conversation. We had only six episodes to to cram in almost 60 years of material. <laughs> um, one thing that I, I thought was really uh, inviting about the way you structured these six episodes was it, it wasn't necessarily chronological, nor was it fundamentally thematic. Um, how did you approach writing within these constraints and uh, and what did you leave out? You know, we made a choice in the show to uh, really highlight uh, political histories. Um, told through the experience of everyday Americans. But, you know, this show was in many ways about uh, kind of the big political ideas of the Cold War, these ideas of containment, uh, these ideas of, a, of the struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, and so I, I think that was, I, I do think that these are probably the most important messages to convey about the Cold War. But anytime that you're telling a political story, it means that you um, don't have as much time to talk about some of the social history stories. Let me figure out your career. Are, did you start in science or did you start in history? Well, I actually started in science. I have uh, dual undergraduate degrees in chemistry and biochemistry. Um, but towards the end of my undergraduate career, I was doing undergraduate research. And I was told that I was asking the wrong kinds of questions. I, I didn't trust the equipment. And I always wanted to know, how do we know what we know? Um, so an advisor strongly suggested that I check out history of science. Um, and I loved it. Um, so I ended up going to a graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. I have a PhD in the history and sociology of science. Um, and so I was studying basically science in the Cold War, a version of science in the Cold War is what my uh, dissertation was about. Um, so I've been editing and writing about various parts of history and in some cases uh, about science 
uh, for the past 15 years now. And you have a book about the history of the Cold War competing with the Soviets? I do. I do. So my first book, Competing with the Soviets, uh, is really a study of the ways that um, science was used to maintain and project state power during the Cold War. Um, it's kind of a greatest hits book. It does uh, it does uh, cover some surprising episodes, but it also covers things like the Manhattan Project and the Apollo um, uh, the Apollo Project, uh, the Star Wars Initiative under the Reagan administration. So it's really all about um, big science, and it's about uh, the stuff of science, how scientific ideas were used to uh, to drive national security during that time period. A really uh, interesting period in American history. Well, you mentioned the Manhattan Project and Star Wars and Apollo program, all of which we got to on American History Tellers. Uh, but you also said that there are some surprising moments. Can you tell us one of those? Absolutely. So one of the things that I did in uh, in that book, which, um, and uh, you know, obviously some of my obsessions about science and the Cold War are very evident in my treatment of the Cold War for American History Tellers, um, but I think it's I think it's really critical to think about the social sciences uh, during this time period. Um, so competing with the Soviets has a chapter about the Great Societies programs under uh, under Johnson, because these these programs were really made possible by new ways of thinking about solving social problems. Um, and the idea was that if scientists could solve these problems, if scientists could use social scientific techniques to prevent nuclear war uh, by doing things like game theory. Um, then surely they could solve the problems of poverty. Um, so one of the really interesting things about the Great Society programs that we don't talk about in American History Tellers, but I've written about elsewhere, is how many of these Great Society programs were actually driven by scientists who had um, done work for the military. Um, some of them came from the RAND Corporation, which was a, uh, you know, obviously the RAND Corporation still exists. It's a nonprofit institution that uh, originally started to give advice to the Air Force. Um, but in the late 60s, they got really involved in urban policy, in um, combat, uh, uh, in uh, poverty eradication efforts, all kinds of urban planning, even traffic flow studies. Uh, so a lot, of the, a lot of the great society programs drew really heavily on kind of a faith in science and the social sciences to solve all kinds of problems. Do you think that that faith in science is appropriate, that, that it worked? Well, you know, I'm a historian, so it's always hard to get me to answer yes or no to any question. <laughs> I would say yes and no. Um, I think the idea that, that science could solve problems uh, in a straightforward, technocratic way uh, was probably misplaced. Um, and we see legacies of that today when people uh, turn to science and hope that, that, that somehow scientists can just offer a up or down yes or no answer to any number of questions. Um, you know, most of the major problems that the United States and the world faces today are complicated questions that have uh, technical and maybe some scientific components. And it's important, it is certainly important and essential to get the scientific and technological um, parts of those questions right. But they're not just scientific and technological questions. They're also political questions, or maybe they're social questions, or they're questions about uh, what it is that a culture values. Um, and, you know, during the Cold War, for a variety of reasons, uh, many people were uh, willing to put more trust in scientists to just solve problems as scientific problems. And that, you know, presented certain challenges. I think we see that in the example of, the, of Project Plowshare, uh, which we talked about in episode four, the idea that you could just use um, kind of bombs to build things because bombs are really good at making holes. Uh, that is one approach to a problem, but it's not necessarily a, a, a holistic problem uh, to questions of infrastructure. Yeah, I um, have to say one of the most remarkable pieces of information I learned in this series was Project Gas Buggy. Mm -hmm. That they actually detonated a bomb underground to try and extract natural gas. Yes, yes. I would say everything about Project Plowshare is pretty remarkable, including the fact that there were some, some detonations. And of course, they didn't quite go as planned. You can't uh, generate clean natural gas uh, via atomic explosions, or at least you can't generate usable natural gas uh, via atomic explosions. Uh, but you know, there was such just a, such a deep desire to find something useful from these devices. It's understandable why the scientist wanted to find something useful in it. Um, you know, it does seem like something that that if people had thought more clearly about, more carefully about, if there had been broader public input into. Uh, perhaps uh, might have gone in a different direction. So I'm thinking about your focus um, uh, and career coming up through science and then into the history of science uh, and then a focus on the Cold War. And I was wondering uh, what about the Cold War fascinated you so much, uh, but then it occurred to me that this was really the largest, fastest, biggest improvement in science uh, 
uh, we've probably ever seen up until that point. Yeah, I mean, you, you've put your finger on it, and it wasn't just the growth in science, uh, but the growth of scientific authority. So, as I mentioned, I, I was an undergraduate in biochemistry, um, and this was the 90s when everybody was talking about the Human Genome Project. Um, and so, you know, in the, in the 90s, um, it seemed like every week there was another story in the newspapers that scientists had found a gene for X or scientists who had found a gene for Y. Um, and, and I was really interested in this question about why... Um, people who were writing about science were so willing to give scientists uh, authority over any number of aspects of American life. And it turns out if you want to think about the relationship between science and authority and power in American life, you have to understand the Cold War. Um, so that's really how I got interested in the Cold War in the first place, was trying to think about where this idea of scientific authority came from, that you could look to scientists as some kind of oracle um, about, you know, any number of problems. So that, that really does stem from a post-war kind of thinking that came out of the Manhattan Project and the bomb. The title of this podcast is American History Tellers, but obviously the Cold War has a lot to do with Soviet history and Chinese history as well. I was wondering, from a scientific history point of view, there was clearly the, the space race, but did we compete with them in any other scientific or technological ways that, that were, were interesting or, or really competitive? Well, you know, you mentioned the space race, and that's an obvious one. Um, and, you know, the nuclear arms race was in some ways a technological race. So uh, that is also a part of that story. But, you know, and there were any number of small stories that one could look at, whether in the question of uh, peaceful nuclear power or solar energy generation or uh, water desalination was another one that the Kennedy administration in particular was really excited about um, you know, possibly having a great scientific breakthrough in water desalination. But, you know, I think that the, the, the bigger trend here is really about just using science itself as a way to compete. You know, which, which nation was generating more PhDs? Um, how many scientists were there per capita? Um, you know, who was producing more journal articles? Uh, this idea that, that science itself, kind of the idea of science, could be something that you could compete on. Um, is really intriguing, including even the ways that you do science. Uh, do you do science um, kind of in a directed way from the center, uh, which was what was happening in the Soviet Union? Or do you decentralize it and let the scientists make the decisions themselves, which was the model that the United States was following in the National Science Foundation? Um, it's a really interesting time where a lot of ideas are bubbling up, uh, not only in terms of the objects of science, but really ideas of science as a field for competition. And do you think that's why, for instance, towards the end of the Cold War, it was American scientists and researchers that came out with semiconductors, personal computers, the, the beginnings of the internet? Uh, well, um, you know, those story, these innovations were very much connected to uh, the, the investment of the federal government. So on the one hand of the United States, um, during the Cold War, uh, American scientists in particular used this language of free enterprise and free scientists and that they were doing things kind of undirected. At the same time, this was the period of time where the United States government invested more directly um, into research than in any other period in American history, um, and particularly in the industries that had some connection to the defense industry, like um, electronics. You know, in some fields, 75 percent of the funding, even in private corporations, was coming from government research. So, um, you know, yes, in some ways, uh, some of the innovations in which the United States uh, may, had some really important breakthroughs, particularly in computing, absolutely um, are related to some of these ideas about how science should function, but not necessarily in the way that you would think. Um, it's not necessarily because it was driven by free enterprise, but because the state was investing um, in uh, innovation and, and absolutely investing in certain kinds of technologies just in a way that they have never before or since. So science, well, it, it hopes to be in a, a pursuit of objective truth. And in many ways, history does the exact same thing. We want to know what happened, what actually happened. But history remains a very subjective and controversial sometimes topic. How is it that as we study history, our opinions change so much throughout the time. We, we adopt different lenses. And even uh, two historians looking at the same set of facts or primary evidence can come up with different conclusions. 
Well, no two historians are the same. And I think no two historians would have the same answer to that question. But really, I think there are three ways of write history. Uh, and one is, uh, the first is really heritage, which is not something that professional historians do as much. The idea of heritage is really... Um, writing history for the purpose of celebration and memorializing the past and finding things that we want to um, to really uh, hold up and celebrate. And so sometimes when historians are told, uh, when members of the public hear something that historians are writing and say that it's not objective, what they're referring to is um, um, maybe that the historians don't necessarily just want to celebrate, that they want to talk about the bad as well as the good. So within the category of history, as opposed to heritage, there are some historians who want to really capture the past as it was at a particular moment of, of time. And then there are historians who want to write about the past, understand the present. I very much put myself in that second category. Um, for me, that's really the point of understanding the past is what, what can we learn from this to get a better sense of our contemporary moment? But what that means when you're doing that kind of history is that you're always looking at things that you're interested in now. Right. So, um, you know, as a historian of science, those being my particular interest, um, I have been very interested in questions of scientist power and scientist authority and how the public uh, regards science. But, you know, thinking in terms of political history, I'm very interested in questions about, um, you know, do we trust the government? Do we trust what uh, political leaders are saying? Uh, what is the relationship between state power and a democracy? Um, how does the United States uphold its ideals? Uh, while at the same time um, protecting its national security. These are ongoing important questions and they're things that I'm very interested in when I'm looking at the past. If you, know, if you were doing another kind of history where you're trying to set yourself in 1950 and say, hey, what does this look like in 1950? That's also a very valid way of doing history. But you might get very different results. You might find out that people in 1950 are really obsessed with something that it had never occurred to you to worry about. Um, and so I think the best kinds of history really combine these two things, that using, um, you know, being open to the questions of the present, uh, because that's what's going to be relevant to your readers or to your listeners, to really engage in issues that people are excited about, but then to be open to what was actually happening in the moment, to find these undiscovered stories, uh, these surprises, uh, things that we weren't expecting to find, uh, but being open to them and then talking about whatever it is that you're seeing happening in the past. A lot of the material, uh, we, we hoped to mention the historians and put notes of, uh, in the show notes of, of where you can find some of this resource material. Um, uh, I had, of course, I'm, I shouldn't have been surprised that there were so many very specific books about very specific topics in the Cold War. <laughs> can you name, you know, if, if our audience is, is intrigued, wants to know more, give us maybe, you know, two or three references that you would uh, send them to first. One of my favorite books uh, on this period that um, I think got a shout out in the series, I'm not sure if it made it into the show notes, um, is a book by a woman named Mary Dudziak called Cold War Civil Rights. And it's just a wonderful book about the relationship between um, international politics and domestic politics during the Cold War period. Um, how concerns about the United States image abroad really shaped conversations at home. Um, it is a phenomenal book about how the civil rights debate played out in the United States, filtered through the lens of Cold War politics. I absolutely recommend that book. If you like nuclear weapons, or if you're interested in nuclear weapons, um, a really critical book to read is uh, Garrett Graff's book, Raven Rock, uh, which was about planning for continuity in government in the, uh, in the event of a nuclear attack. Um, and the spoiler, I'm, I'm going to do a spoiler. The spoiler in this book is that there is no real continuity of government after a nuclear attack, that in the event of a nuclear attack, the first thing that goes is democracy. Um, but this book is an amazing exploration of, you know, bunkers and plans to move the Supreme Court, you know, underground or, you know, how what happens uh, in White Sulphur Springs. I mean, it, it's, a, it's an amazing and terrifying book. Um, a, lot, a, a similar book in terms of terrifying is Eric Schlosser's Command and Control, uh, which really um, is a harrowing account of nuclear accidents and near misses um, that really uh, gives the reader a sense of how impossible it is to keep a system like that safe. And you have a book coming up. I do. I was just finishing up my, I just finished up the manuscript of my second book uh, when um, I was in touch with Wondery about writing this show. Uh, which is the reason that I had all of these hundreds of scholarly books at my fingertips. 
Um, so I'm writing a book about the role of science in cultural diplomacy. It's basically a book about um, the relationship between science and freedom and democracy during the Cold War. Um, and it's called Freedom's Laboratory, the Cold War Struggle for the Soul of Science. Uh, when do you expect it to uh, to be released or published? Uh, if all goes well, this should be a, a fall 2018 release. Uh, so it's not quite available for pre-order yet, but it should be uh, hopefully by April. Okay. Anything else you would like to mention? Uh, just that this was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? <laughs> thank you so much for talking with me. Um, it was a real pleasure. And thank you for bringing us this six-part series on, on the Cold War. Well, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to talk about it with you today. It was really so much fun working on the show. And I cannot wait to hear uh, the, next, uh, the next series. American history is largely a tale of gumption. Let's throw this tea into the harbor. Let's take on giant European powers. Let's pitch in and win a world war twice. Just for the hell of it, let's see if we can't go without a drink for 13 years, then decide, nah, we deserve it. We're Americans. These days, if you've got gumption, if you've got something you need to do, something you need to say, then you need a website. But websites require coding and graphic design and HTML, PHP, Java, whatevers. Or do they? Not with Squarespace. If you need to showcase your work, blog or publish content, sell products or services of all kinds, promote your physical or online business, or even announce an upcoming event or special project, Squarespace can help. You'll get beautiful, ready-to-go templates from world-class designers, powerful e-commerce functionality to sell just about anything, all customizable to your brand, your mission, with just a few clicks. So go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And if you'd like to support American History Tellers and you want to hear more shows like it, then please, when you're ready to launch, use the offer code TELLERS to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com, offer code TELLERS. So, it's the end of January. The holidays are well over. You're back at work. The kids are back at school. Heading into February just is not that exciting. But there are two things coming up that I think can give you something to look forward to. The Super Bowl and a great deal on a sleep number bed. With a sleep number bed, you can choose the ideal firmness for both sides. The new beds are so smart that they sense your movement and automatically adjust, keeping you sleeping comfortably throughout the night. There's even an adjustment for snoring. Does your bed do that? Maybe you've considered a sleep number bed for yourself or, or as a gift for someone else, but thought you couldn't afford one. So now, in honor of 52 years of football's favorite Sunday, Sleep Number is offering $52 off any item over $100 from Sleep Number, which, by the way, have you tried their pillows? Certifiably amazing. Visit sleepnumber.com slash big game to get your $52 coupon now through February 4th. Again, that's sleepnumber.com slash big game. Our next guest on this special interview episode is Patrick Wyman. Patrick has a PhD in late antiquity history, and he hosts two of my favorite history podcasts, Fall of Rome and Tides of History, both from Wondery. You can find both of these shows on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to this show, American History Tellers. Patrick is a phenomenal historical storyteller and has great insight on the Cold War as a historical event. Here's my conversation with Patrick, again via Skype. So the term superpower was essentially a Cold War term applied to the United States, uh, the British Empire, and the Soviet Union after World War II. But it occurs to me that these were not the first superpowers. I do not think so. Uh -uh. I think that in terms of the geographic area that it dominated, the Roman Empire was the first superpower in the West. Um, it was far longer lived and more deeply rooted than something like Alexander the Great's empire, which lasted a very brief period of time. The Persian empire lasted longer, but it was, and it was certainly an empire and a powerful one, but it was more geographically restricted. It touched fewer parts of the world. I think the Roman empire really qualifies as the first and only superpower in, in Western European history. It was matched in its later years by another superpower, the Sassanid empire of Persia. Um, and 
that conflict between the Persian Empire and the Rome and the later Roman Empire, which lasted from the middle of the third century AD on until the seventh century uh, AD, when when the Sassanids were overrun by um, the Islamic conquerors coming out of the Arabian Peninsula. The parallels between a the parallels between the Cold War and the conflicts between those two powers are hard to ignore. Part of the reason that they're hard to ignore is because when this conflict became a major topic of study was during the Cold War. And so the lens through which modern scholars have read that conflict, have looked at those two empires, one East, one West, uh, as it was had a lot in common with how people were viewing the Cold War at that time. It's hard not to read the past through the lens of the present. And the Cold War was the defining thing uh, in international politics, um, society, culture for for that 50 year period. It's hard for it not to have affected the way that we understand that per- that particular past. And do you think historians during the Cold War, looking back, um, viewed the conflict between Rome and the Sassanids as uh, as a moral conflict, like like they might have viewed the Cold War? I think modern scholars have tried not to see it in those terms um, because there's a kind of a, a sense that you should be more objective about these things. Um, but I think if, in terms of who scholars were identifying with in that particular conflict, it was usually the Roman Empire. I think there was a sense among among Western scholars that where like who are you more like? Who are you not in this, not necessarily rooting for, but with whom do you identify? It was always the the Roman Empire. The Romans themselves, absolutely thought they were the good guys in this. And yes, for them, there was a moral dimension to it and a, and a religious dimension. Um, one of the reasons that uh, one of the reasons that conflicts cropped up or things that were used as a pretext for conflicts was the treatment of Christians within the Sassanid Persian Empire, of whom there were many. Um, the Sassanids themselves were, were generally not Christians. They were Zoroastrians. Um, and they more or less left Christians alone a lot of the time. Sometimes they didn't. And when they did not, that the Romans, if they were itching for a fight, often seized on that as a reason for it. So there was a moral dimension to that, a, more, a moral and religious dimension um, for leading into, leading into that conflict as a, as, a, as a component of it. But the conflict between Rome and the Sassanids was not analogous to the Cold War. Uh, they had they were in constant hostilities with each other. Many real hot wars between the two of them. But this is stretched out over a period of four centuries. So there were many periods in between where um, they where there were not where there was not conflict. There was a there's a long period in the in the fifth and the sixth centuries where there's no conflict between them. But there are always tensions. Right. There are always tensions here. There's a there's a long borderland between the two of them. There are. Other interested parties, there are steppe tribes, there are the Arab tribes that lived in the in that kind of contested borderland between them. So in terms of proxy fights, this is one of the this is one of the big things that scholars in the in, in during the Cold War who were investigating these things were worried were thinking about. Were these were these borderlands between the two of them? Were proxy conflicts? Were different groups, or different Arab tribes, um, Ghazanids and the Lakhmids, as uh, as proxies for each of the two superpowers? And they would fight each other regularly. So there is a there is a direct kind of way of looking at this that that brings a Cold War lens to it. Um, what is the dimension of war at this time period? The beginning of the Cold War is the end of World War II. We saw total war in which population centers are decimated. Um, and then, of course, nuclear warfare. Certainly, the the state of weaponry isn't the same. But how much was society as as a whole affected by the rivalry? I think if you lived in the borderlands, um, then a very, very great deal, because the the two powers were not. Th- there was a strong frontier between the two of them. Were a lot there were lots of fortifications, but there was also trade. There was intercourse going back and forth between the two of them. If war broke out there, if you lived within a couple hundred miles on either side of that frontier, then your life was going to be deeply embedded in it. Um, there were constant expeditions going back and forth, constant fighting, constant raiding during those times when the conflict was either warm or hot. Um, <clears throat> if you were elsewhere, well, the, what would have affected your life? Was the extent to which you, the Roman state or the or the kind of Persian uh, governmental apparatus needed to pay for these things? So the Roman state existed to service the Roman army. The Roman army existed in the east to to protect this frontier. Essentially, that's what it was there for. So when you paid taxes, the taxes that you were paying 
were going toward paying for the Roman war machine, which again existed essentially to hold off the Persians, to intimidate the Persians, or uh, in in some cases to fight the Persians. That's what it was there for. So your life, your interactions with the government were with with the Roman state were all predicated on needing to pay for the apparatus that would that would protect the empire's frontiers. What was the the competition rooted in? Was it merely dynastic, merely a, a, a grab for resources or, or or territory, or was there real roots in ideology or theology? I think you can view it through a number of different lenses. The straightforward geopolitical one is <clears throat> the one that makes the, I think it's the one that makes the most sense uh, because they the two powers rubbed up against each other at various at various points of tension. They're, they had interests. Um, they were I mean they were great powers. They had interests that that were often in conflict with one another. Um, I think in terms of a moral or ideological dimension to it, we shouldn't underestimate the extent to which it was the job of a monarch and the job it was the job of an emperor it was the job of a persian shah it was the job of a lot of people there to fight to uh, to be in conflict was a worthy goal in itself um the idea of fighting wars between these two powers was deeply attract was deeply attractive almost on its own terms um that to be involved in that conflict was a justification in its own right. As far as an ideological dimension, I mentioned the the religious aspects to it. Um, I think we shouldn't underestimate that. I think that there were a lot of Romans who took very seriously the idea of the protection of Christians, um, the idea of themselves, and kind of an emerging sense of uh, of militant piety, you might say, that that uh, there was a religious duty on behalf of Christians, especially when you get later, especially when you get into the, the 5th, 6th, 7th centuries. Um, like, for example, the idea of jihad that that has uh, remained very important in Islamic thought and theology um, since the very beginning, that grew out of a context of militant piety among the among the Persians and among the Romans of that time. So Islam pops up in the, the beginning of the seventh century. That was a time of militant piety in general. There were ideological and religious dimensions to, to that conflict. It was a thing that people thought at the time was important. Uh, the emperor Heraclius, when he goes off to fight the, the, the Sassanids, um, and the, the last, uh, the, uh, the very last great war that kind of ruined both the Eastern Roman empire and the, and the Sassanids before the Islamic conquest, there was an explicitly religious dimension to that. Um, it was, it, he was engaging in something that was like holy war. Um, and, and I think we shouldn't underestimate that, that as time went on, and that conflict did take on an increasingly religious and, and moral angle to it. One thing that differentiates the Cold War from, from many others is that it was an informational war more than anything else. Uh, lots of propaganda and espionage. To what extent did information or misinformation play a role in government or conflict in, in the Roman Empire? That is an outstanding question, um, and it's one that a, a few historians have actually looked at. There's a great book called uh, Information and Frontiers that looks at kind of late Roman frontiers and flows of information. My sense of this as somebody who worked a lot on communication and on the movement of peoples is that there was quite a bit of information flow. The Romans were very concerned about having access to information. About um, about making sure that there was ro regular and consistent communication about record keeping. Uh, the Romans were amazing and uh, and kind of slightly obsessive compulsive rec record keepers. Uh, that was the thing they were very concerned about. But so if you were uh, like um, commanding a post on the frontier, you were getting reports, written reports from elsewhere. You were sending written reports from elsewhere. You, there were people coming across all the time, um, and, and I think like. In general, there's a lot of information flow. The Roman frontiers are best understood as zones of interaction where there are lots of things happening, rather than as hard, firm lines um, that were that were imper that were impermeable to to things coming across. The Romans knew a fair bit about what was happening in Persia. They had spies there. They kept spies there. They had diplomats who went back and forth. Um, the Persians had spies in in Constantinople. Uh, they wanted to know what was happening there. There was information traveling regularly because. This is a world, the Roman world and the, and the Persian world as well, were worlds of movement. Um, 
there was a lot of trade compared to what came after uh, and compared to what had come before. These were worlds that were defined by movement and defined by communication uh, in ways that was not true either before or after they existed. Um, that was that is a central defining fact. I think that's what makes them their own particular peculiar worlds uh, is the way in which there was a high volume of that kind of thing. Um, there was lots of information traveling all the time. The American Post Office dates back to 1775 during the Second Continental Congress when Benjamin Franklin was appointed the first Postmaster General. In 1792, Franklin's operation became the Post Office Department, made a cabinet-level department 80 years later in 1872, and then 99 years after that, in 1971, the United States Postal Service became the independent agency we know it today. And all throughout that time, Going to the post office has been a gigantic pain in the ass. That began to change in 1996 with the founding of Stamps.com. With Stamps.com, you can print real U.S. postage for any letter, any package, right from your home or office. All available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. They'll even send you a digital scale so you can weigh your letters and packages and print the exact amount of postage every time. It really could not be easier to use. Just click, print, mail, and you are done. Right now, listeners of American History Tellers can get a special offer on a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale with no long-term commitments. So go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Tellers. That's Stamps.com. Click on the microphone and enter Tellers. I'm 44, which means that I was tooling around on my, you know, huffy bicycle in the middle of the 80s. And the Cold War was something that was profoundly real to me. But as a child, uh, it wasn't comprehensible. What is your personal experience with the Cold War? Some of my earliest memories are Cold War related. Um, I was I was born in 1985. And one of my very first memories, my, fir my first two very strong memories of kind of external events are, one, the 1988 election. I remember that very clearly. Um, and then, but then the next thing I remember after that that kind of connected to a broader context was the fall of the Berlin Wall. I remember that very clearly. I remember how kind of awestruck people were by it, like this enormous thing coming down uh, that, had, that symbolized and defined an entire era coming down very quickly. Right. Like it seemed like it was a moment of massive change. I remember very clearly the fall of the fall of the Soviet Union. I remember seeing Gorbachev on TV talking. And obviously I didn't understand Russian then. Still don't understand it now. But I remember the sense of uh, I remember the sense of big, important things happening. I remember that very clearly. Um, and but I remember what I remember very clearly. And I think this this plays into why I've spent as long studying the fall of the Roman Empire as I have. Why that's interested me so much is I remember the breakup. Like, I remember paying attention to what was happening in the former Soviet republics. I remember the way that people were talking about that as a time of kind of endless possibility. I remember that about the 90s, because the 90s were like my formative decade. You know, that's that's, um, that's when I grew, became aware of all of these things. And so I think in terms of my own interest in a time that follows the breakup of an empire or that encompasses the breakup of an empire, um, I think that's that's what I mostly got out of it is the end of it. It is the aftermath of it. What does that aftermath look like? Why do people do the things that they do and so on? Yeah, I would agree that that, that the end of the cold war is one of the most instructive moments of the entire conflict. One of the things I like about tides of history is that you try to instill upon your listeners, uh, the fact that history is really just a stream of individual decisions that it need not have gone the direction it did, but for, a certain set of circumstances. And I think the Cold War is, is very instructive of, of that lesson as well. So many mistakes, misunderstandings, and then decisions that become intractable policy were, were made and altered the course of, of the entire globe over a span of 50 years. And I would imagine the same for hundreds of years, uh, given the Romans' decisions and, and policies. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's there's a big lesson in there about the reasons why, like, a particular decision undertaken at a particular point in time. For example, um, the division of the Roman Empire into two parts in 395. The Roman Empire had been divided before. It would be divided again. Nobody knew at that point that that was going to be the last time that the two empires were ruled by a single person. That was going to be the last time they were a single unit. And yet that defined the thousand years that followed and beyond. 
um, the decision at that particular point in time for each of the two sons, two feckless sons of a particular emperor to get half of the empire. Nobody knew that that was going to be a permanent thing. And yet it was. I think of like the Gulf of Tonkin resolution um, that I don't think anybody knew precisely how that was going to play out, that that was going to be such an inflection point for American foreign policy, um, where that would lead not only in terms of the in terms of Vietnam, but in terms of what the Vietnam War did to the American psyche. Um, and to uh, American expectations of what would follow that. Like these these decisions that do not necessarily seem to be a big deal at the time can end up having long-term ramifications. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan too. I mean, I think same kind of thing. Like thought it'd be quick in and out. And yet in a, in a deep um, in a deep psychological sense that scarred the Soviet Union for the entire time that followed. How much debate do you think went into the Gulf of Tonkin resolution? Or, or even in more modern days, the, the Patriot Act? Not nearly enough. I think it seems clear in hindsight. Um, what, what, what's always really striking to me about the Gulf of Tonkin resolution in, with the benefit of hindsight is how relatively uncontroversial it was at the time um, and how, uh, how, many, how bipartisan it was. There were a lot of people on board for the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. The same thing that's a, I mean, I'm glad you brought up the Patriot Act. You could say the same thing for, for the decision to go to war in Iraq as well. Those were like, those were well supported. Like they were, that was the kind of consensus of the political establishment was that these were the right things to do at those particular points in time. But, you know, consensus is a funny thing. I mean, certainly in politics, but, but it makes me think about historical consensus, um, not how the historians viewed the fall of Rome but how histories themselves seem to fall. I mean, clearly the, the fall of Rome was studied by more than just the historians of the 90s. How did a revolution in history about history happen? I think to some extent, we're just always going to be a prisoner of our times. We're going to be limited by the kind of broader prevailing currents in, in society and in thought as a whole. Um, I, I think my way of viewing historians as an academic discipline is that we're kind of jacks of all trades. Um, we're not specialists in literature, but we'll use literature. We're not archaeologists, but we may use archaeology. We're not uh, we're not anthropologists, but we may draw on anthropological theory. So I think historians more so than specialists in other fields, are constrained by what's happening at a current moment in the world around them. I think we're always writing, our histories of the past are always histories of our present, you know, in some in some deep and meaningful way. And so when you're living in a period of time with this, where the, the, the Soviet-US relationship defines kind of foreign relations, defines geopolitics, um, you may be inclined to see the world as one of power blocks. Um, power blocks that rub up against each other in particular ways. I think that's that's kind of what I was trying to get at with the Roman Sassanid thing, where like you know now a post-Soviet, post uh, post Cold War world is much more inclined to look at the frontiers themselves and see how individual people or individual groups of people living there may have interacted with each other, where the state provides a context but isn't kind of a monolithic block. Um, that so I think that's a I think that's a big difference. But but also you know with some perspective on what the fall of the Soviet Union has actually meant, that changes our perspective on what the fall of a Roman Empire may have actually meant as well. Um, I think it gives us a sense that these things are not static, um, that our, our understanding of them is going to change, our understanding of their meaning too, about why does the fall of the Soviet Union matter, about why does the fall of the Roman Empire matter. We're always going to read that through the lens of our own times. All right, as we, as we finish up here, um, the series on the Cold War ends with this interview episode. We are embarking next on a series on prohibition, another uh, portion of American history that has uh, deeply affected uh, American society. So leading into that series on prohibition, I wanted to ask, what was Rome's relationship to alcohol? That is a great question. That is a really wonderful question. Um, and because I think it gets at something that we may not think about all the time, which is that um, people in the past were on a kind of uh, were had a different relationship with psychotropic substances than we ourselves do. Uh, that's which is an important thing, you know. Like if everybody throughout history, pretty much, is kind of a general human characteristic has tried to mess with their brain chemistry in one in some way, shape, or form. Um, we have a whole array of pharmaceuticals that help us do that, and illicit and illicit drugs, and we have alcohol, and we have all these different ways of, of kind of messing with our brain chemistry. People in the past really had booze. Um, and they consumed more of it. 
uh, the the average Roman would have consumed somewhere in the range of somewhere north of a bottle of wine per day, um, according to normal consumption. In the in in the medieval period, um, people uh, like like an English peasant would have been drinking ale from the beginning of day uh, from the beginning of the day with breakfast throughout the day uh, and all the way up till the uh, up till uh, the end of the day, all the way up until bedtime. Um, it would have been part of their normal kind of course of life to be a little bit buzzed. Pretty regularly. Uh, same with same with the Romans too. I mean, if we're if we're looking back at the Roman Empire, they it would have been part of your normal experience to to have alcohol in your system. Um, that was true in in early America too. In the 1790s, uh, there were uh, like for there was a period of time where the average consumption of hard liquor would have been something like a quart of uh, of whiskey a day for your average adult male. So. This is something, and leading up to prohibition too. Despite the temperance movements, alcohol consumption was really heavy. Uh, it's easy for us to kind of look back in a puritanical sense at prohibition, um, but by our normal standards, these people were drinking a lot all the time. There was a great deal of alcohol consumption in a way that's kind of hard for us to understand with our array of other substances that are available to us to to make us feel in particular ways. They had booze and uh, and they consumed a lot of it. <laughs> so I, I think it it behooves us to bear in mind that on a, on a basic kind of brain chemistry level, people in the past were were experiencing the world in in fundamentally different ways. If you do drink, what is your favorite drink? <laughs> uh, I'm a beer guy. I really like IPAs. I grew up in an area uh, of central Washington called Yakima that has – it's one of the world's leading hop-producing regions. So I'm really used to the smell of hops and the taste of hops. So I love a good hoppy beer. That's, okay. uh, that is my go-to. Well, I can, I can grant you uh, regional familiarity with, with hops, but I tend not to like IPAs. I'm more of a, a roasty, malty Belgian beer type of person. Oh, I, don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of those as well. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. Um, where are you taking Tides of History next? So I think I'll be, I, I'm cutting off my coverage of the fall of the Roman Empire in, with a couple of episodes in February. I've spent the better part of a decade working on it. I think it's time to move on to, to other topics. But I'll be continuing with the Rise of the Modern World episodes for the rest of 2018. And then I think as we get into 2019, I'm going to move to the early Middle Ages. I think I'm going to cover the Dark Ages, uh, as they're sometimes called. And I'll be looking at uh, the Vikings all the way up to the First Crusades. Um, kind of early barbarian kingdoms, the holy, the rise of the Holy Roman Empire, Islamic conquests, um, the Vikings, and then all the way up to, uh, to, yeah, the First Crusade, I think. But for the rest of 2018, I'll be covering the Hundred Years' War, the Black Death, um, just some other things in there, the printing press, uh, conquest and exploration of the New World, uh, the first kind of wave of globalization. That's what's on the docket for the rest of 2018 on Tides of History. Okay, so just trifles of, of human endeavors. Okay. <laughs> yeah, nothing particularly important. All right, well, thank you again. Uh, I really enjoyed the show, and uh, I'm glad to have had you on this interview episode of American History Tellers. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure watching American History Tellers get out there. You, you've put together a really amazing show. Thank you very much. This has been the end of our series on the Cold War. But next time on American History Tellers, we will be starting a brand new six-episode series on another important period in our nation's history, Prohibition. Here's a preview. When we think of Prohibition, we imagine flappers, jazz music, speakeasies, and bootleggers, federal agents hunting down Al Capone, reformers pouring bottles of liquor into gutters in a frenzy of self-righteousness. Next on American History Tellers, a six-part series on the story of our nation's experiment with sobriety. We'll look at how a changing America made banning booze possible in the first place, and how a constitutional amendment that outlawed alcohol accidentally started a party that lasted for 14 years. Listen next week as we start our next series on American History Tellers. Our history, your story. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Wondery.com, or wherever you're listening to this podcast right now. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes, which includes some details you might have missed, and also some information from our sponsors. Please support this show by supporting them. If you'd like to hear more of American History Tellers and other Wondery shows, in addition to extra content, early access, and exclusive perks, you can subscribe to Wondery Plus. Go to wondery.com slash plus, that's P-L-U-S, 
American History Tellers is hosted, sound designed, and edited by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Executive producers Ben Adair, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondery.